uh, right now at UC Earth that can hear it. So uh, here's what I plan to do. I am going to start out with just a few high level thoughts about uh, learning data. Which of course is a uh, uh, topic that we hear a lot about all over the place. Um, I'll give just a very, very quick intro to reduce water modeling. Then spend most of the talk on this part. I'll talk about the work uh, that we've been doing for many years in a method that we call operator inference. Uh, go through the basics and then uh, talk about some of the more recent work that we've been doing. And this is uh, really young, my first job in a somatic manifold operator inference. So if you don't like linear algebra, this will be the point of the talk where you can start checking your email or uh, your email on your on your phone. So starting out just with a with a high level. So we've been here. This is the Center for Computational Science and Engineering uh, at the Open Institute, where the Open Institute for Computational Engineering and Sciences. Um, I often think that the field of computational science and engineering, or maybe just computational science, as it's referred to by many, especially in the Department of Energy, is perhaps the most important field in the world that nobody has ever heard of. Um, and of course, there's a lot of also, I think, confusion in the wider world when people talk about computing and they use the term computing and computer science synonymously without appreciating that computational science is uh, a different field and is, is uh, well, it has some overlap, has some, some differences. So what is computational science and engineering? The way I think about it, the field that at, has at its core the notion of a mathematical model, mathematical model of a complex system, complex system in engineering or science or medicine or geosciences. And what is a mathematical model? Well, often that comes to us in the form of a system of partial differential equations or ordinary differential equations, uh, some kind of a mathematical model that lets us express uh, the behavior of a, of a complex system. What do we do in computational science and engineering? We take that mathematical model, we uh, apply our favorite numerical technique to come up with a numerical model. And again, classically, this would include things like finite difference, finite volume, finite element, but of course, the range of, te of techniques that take us from mathematical models to numerical models is much, much richer than just those uh, PD discrimination methods that I, that I mentioned. Uh, then we bring in data. And by the way, this is not a new thing. This is not something that computational science and engineering just started doing in the last five years. There is a long history of bringing in data. We used to call it an inverse problem. I'll be a little bit sarcastic here, but the notion of an inverse problem, once you have a mathematical model, a numerical model, and you bring in data to uh, calibrate parameters or to learn about uh, quantities in your mathematical model that you can't observe directly, that's the field of inverse problems and assimilation. And then wrapping all of that in a notion of decision-making, why are we doing all of this? Sometimes it's the scientific understanding but more often than not, it's because we're trying to drive decision making. That might mean uh, optimal design, it might mean control of a physical process, or it could be decision making around uh, experimental design. Where do we install the sensors? So, so, when I think about the field of computational science and engineering, I really uh, think about all of these elements. In different ways uh, as we bring computing to bear on uh, grand challenge problems across science engineering medicine uh, and much and much more okay so just uh as a little bit of food for thought i want you to think you know what what, what happens if you take the mathematical model away and you get left with numerical models data and decision making and again not to pass things too broadly but in many ways this is this is machine learning especially if we talk about machine learning when it comes to being applied for uh, the complex problems that I care about, say, as an aerospace engineer, you know, where, without the mathematical model, without that thing that is really at the core of what we do in computational science, what are you left with? And I would say, uh, well, I just said what you get left with is train and hope, hope that you have enough training data and hope that the data that you've trained your model on is going to be good enough so that when you deploy this numerical model for key decisions, you do well. And 
this may be perfectly fine and in fact is perfectly fine in many settings but there are many many settings and again i had on as an aerospace engineer where this is just not going to it's not going to get up here so as you go through especially to the students as you go through your academic career just don't forget about the mathematical models that are the core of what we do and that's not to say that machine learning doesn't have an incredible role to play in what we do as computational scientists but that mathematical model is, is, a, is a really key part of, of what we do. Now, I don't normally put cartoons in my, my slides, but I really like this one. This one, um, just, I think, just gets it all. What happens if the answers are wrong? Just stir this pile of linear algebra and still start to look at the right. Okay, so um, this, I, uh, the, this sort of sentiment uh, around the imperative of physics based modeling, that mathematical core. Uh, I wrote a, an a opinion piece together with my colleagues, I'm Martin Clark and Patrick Heinbach at the Open Institute. This appeared in Nature Computational Science um, almost, almost two years ago that sort of talked about this importance and pointed out just the pitfalls of really not having a mathematical model as a very central element when it comes to a large class of problems in engineering science and geosciences. And I want to touch just really quickly on uh, a couple of the key points just to remind you of, of what, why, are, why are models so important. First, they're principles. They're a representation of the governing laws of nature that innately embed the concept of time, space, and causality. I get very, very frustrated reading papers that are discovering physics. This is a very important topic to discover hidden physics, to discover unknown physics. It's an incredibly important topic for systems where you don't have physical laws. There are many such examples in biology. But papers that are discovering physics and then applying it to the flow over a cylinder, come on, this is nonsense. So that's just not right. So these models are principles. They embed the concepts of time, space, and causality. There are many, many, many important problems in the world where we do not have to learn these relationships because the key, the governing equations, express them for us. They are predictive. And this goes back to the, the, the train and hope. Hope is not enough if you are designing an aircraft where people's lives are at risk. We need to be able to make predictions. And if you look at the definition from uh, largely under the Department of Energy around predictive science, to be predictive, a model needs to be able to extrapolate, to, to generalize, but to do so with known levels of confidence. You need to know how good are these predictions you are making that are for conditions that you may not have data for. And What's so powerful about physics-based models is that within the, the realm of applicability of the models, they are constraining the predictions to lie on solution manifolds that are defined by the laws of nature. So again, these governing laws are taking these vast infinite dimensional spaces and carving out the manifolds that obey the laws. And that is incredibly powerful. Uh, these models are structured. Uh, it's very nice to have expressive representations, things like neural networks that are incredibly expressive and very general purpose. But I think sometimes we forget just how much structure there is in our problems. And you're gonna see this theme come through in my talk. The structured form of the governing equations embeds physical properties and physical constraints. And those properties and constraints are so important because those are the things that let us actually predict because they are embedding what is the nature of, of our system. System. So this notion of structure is incredibly important. And again, I feel that often we are in a rush to get good results, forget about the, the structure of the, the problem. And then lastly, this is an incredibly important point. Um, yes, we live in the age of big data. We're all dealing with a ton of data. When uh, I think of myself as an engineer, I can almost never measure what it is I want to know. The measurements are almost always indirect. And what's more, the measurements don't come for free. This is something that's very different between an engineering system and let's say something that lives on the internet that's collecting data from, from let's say, Clickstream. On an engineering system, every sensor on board the system has weight, it costs money, and it draws power requirements. And this is it, this power requirements is huge if you start to think about, for example, autonomous drones. You can't just load them up with sensors because Sensors will drain all the batteries before you move them slow in any way. So there's a huge, huge trade-off there. The data are not free. 
the uh, the observations are almost always indirect and and noisy and sparse. And the same is true in the geosciences. The amount of data we have about planet Earth and what's going on. Just think about the ocean. What fraction of the ocean do you think we're actually sensing? Tiny, tiny, tiny amount. It may be big data in terms of gigabytes, but it's so sparse with respect to the parameters that we need to understand in order to make predictions about what's going to happen to the climate in the in the coming decades. So let's not trick ourselves into thinking that the data are so voluminous that we don't need more. Okay. So physics-based models are wonderful. It's one of my favorite things. They bring predictive capability, but of course there's a huge catch, which is computational expense, right? It's not so simple as just get uh, these governing laws, discretize them with your favorite method, get your favorite high performance computing system and off you go. And uh, a lot of the work that I've been doing in the last few years, we've been working with the Air Force on um, combustion simulations for rocket engines. So this is an area where over the last couple of decades, the Air Force has invested a tremendous amount and the methods have advanced to the point that you can now do uh, reasonable 3D simulations of a rocket engine. And when I say reasonable, don't, we still can't simulate it with scale to really get what's going on, but you, you, you have simulations that have a uh, reasonable agreement with experiments. Problem is the simulation for a full rocket engine on the order of three months. For one one simulation, why did the Air Force invest in these capabilities? It wasn't to analyze the design; it was to inform the design process to understand what are good choices about geometry or injection or fuel or control uh, to understand uncertainty. And if it's three months per analysis, you can imagine you don't, it's really not very useful as a design. So uh, physics-based models bring all these wonderful things. Like I talked about, but uh, they're computationally expensive and uh, so computationally expensive that they really are still, uh, for many of the, 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 the biggest, the grand challenges facing society, still too expensive to really be used routinely in design or control or uncertainty computation. So this is where reduced order modeling uh, comes in and really a critical enabler for accelerating predictive computations in support of engineering design. Reduce sort of modeling is probably a topic that's pretty familiar, I think, to everybody here. The idea is shown here graphically. So over here is my high fidelity uh, physics-based simulation. It has usually hundreds of thousands, millions, maybe even billions of degrees of freedom. Simulation time, minutes, hours, days, even in that extreme example, maybe even months. And so what I want to come up with is an surrogate model some kind of a simplified model that has lower dimension, lower complexity, and importantly, can be solved much faster. When I think about reduced order modeling, I think about three steps. A training step, where we want to somehow query this high fidelity system to generate training data. The training data are going to come in the form of uh, solutions, state solutions, that in the reduced order modeling world are usually referred to as snapshots. So these are different solutions at different points in time or for different uh, parameter values. The second step is to identify structure. So from this high dimensional set of snapshots, remember these snapshots live in my multi-million dimensional state space of that high fidelity model. I want to identify some kind of a structure that will let me simplify. The workforce of structure identification for not all, but for many methods is the signal value decomposition to find a low rank representation of that snapshot set uh, and then represent that with a low dimensional basis, typically the less singular vectors of, um, of the, of the uh, snapshot, that snapshot maybe. Again, not all methods use this. And as I get to the last part of the talk, I'll uh, Talk about how we're moving to nonlinear manifolds in this, this second step here. But again, the workforce here is really the singular value of the composition. And then the third step. And by the way, if I stopped here, this, this really could be a machine learning uh, approach, right? This notion of complex system generating training data and then identifying some kind of a structure, um, maybe fitting some kind of a generic representation that somehow explains the data that you, you have. So how is reduced order modeling different? It's really in this third step, where now we go back to the physics, back to the governing partial differential equations, 
and mathematically project that governing equation onto the flow dimensional basis we identified in step two. And this third step is, is so important because this is where the physics and the structure and everything that we know about the system from a first principle standpoint comes back and is going to be embedded in the in the reduced order model. And of course, there are many methods to do this. And uh, within those methods, there are ways in which you should carry out these steps to retain certain properties, certain structure in the uh, reduced model. I'm not going to talk about all of those, but uh, Professor Patera, who's sitting up there, has uh, been absolutely one of the pioneers in um, establishing methods that do this in an extremely rigorous way. So that when you come up with this reduced model, you don't just get the reduced model, you get a way to very rapidly compute error estimators that tell you just how good is the model when you start to use it for predictions that we didn't see in the, in the training. And again, it's just such an important piece of the puzzle. It's not good enough for many situations to train and code. We can do better. We can do better. Okay, so... Um, just to really define some notation, again, the starting point, and I mean, let me emphasize that the work that I'm doing, the reduced order modeling, there are a, a number of parts of problems where we don't know the physics, and the goal is to learn models for physics, and there are people who work on that problem. My starting point is a high fidelity model that we know and can query, and we want to come up with a reduced order model. So we're starting with a physics based model. Uh, I see all these things about uh, various physics based models. You know, Again, concretely, what is the physics based model? It's often a nonlinear or a set of nonlinear partial differential equations. For my combustion problem, it's the Navier Stokes equation for uh, density, momentum, and energy conservation, conservation of mass, momentum, and energy, combined with the equations of uh, the chemistry. So, conservation of chemical species and all the balance that comes with it. So, I guess it's this nasty uh, set of of nonlinear PDEs. We're going to discretize these equations with our favorite discretization method. And uh, then, because I, I'm kind of blinded by the light, in case you guys can't tell, which is, was, it, was that you, Jacob, sitting there? Me, yes. <laughs> As Professor White knows, because I love to think in state space, I'm going to kind of leave the PDEs to the side and I'm going to work with the state space system here. So I'm going to use X to the state. So this is the discretized state of the partial differential equations. So for example, the density, momentum, energy, chemical species, discretized now on a computational grid. So again, X is the state where there's going to be millions of degrees of freedom. Uh, I may have linear terms. So these linear terms that I'm writing here as under a bit of a mistake, you can get it will come up if in the partial differential equations, I have something like a linear diffusion here in the partial differential equation. Uh, and then I'm gonna stick everything else in this nonlinear uh, part here, the, uh, the, this nonlinear term here, if it's a function of the state, you here are gonna be inputs. So these are gonna be things like forcing or boundary conditions uh, or a control input on the system. And then I may also have a part that's linear with respect to the input. So when I work with these systems, just think about a um, you know a complex model, uh, a set of partial differential equations that that sit underneath. Okay, so we talked about the three steps of reduced order modeling. What does that look like mathematically? Let's start with a linear system. So there's no x. So x dot equal a x plus b u. And here, no parametric dependence. So this is a linear time invariant system, our flat system. Uh, how does it work? Again, we generate data. Let's flip the snapshot. Uh, I'm going to again here talk about the proper orthogonal decomposition, the POD, where again the workforce is the singular value decomposition. So, using the SCD, we've identified a low dimensional basis here, B. So, B is long and skinny, its columns are the basis vectors. And I'm going to choose R basis vectors, where R is going to be much, much less than the, the big linear dimensional N that I started with. I'm going to put this approximation into the governing equation. I'll have a residual. And then I'm going to impose, impose an orthogonality condition uh, where I can either introduce another basis W 
or as is often done, I can just choose W to be the same basis B, which is a working projection. Suppose this orthogonality condition, and what do I get? I get the reduced order model. Now, X hat here is the reduced order state. It's got dimension R, so 10, so 100 instead of million. And uh, these matrices, A hat and B hat, are nothing but the projections of the big A and the big B onto the R dimensional, the low dimensional subspace that is defined by the basic B. So that should be very, very familiar to you. But as you look at this, it's really important to appreciate that approximation by projection into a low dimensional subspace is very, very special because it is a form of approximation that preserves the structure of the governing equation. Put the linear system in, you get a linear system out. And by the way, that's not just true for linear systems. It's also true if you were to introduce a uh, quadratic term. So now I'm taking x L equal a x plus b u, and I'm going to add this term h x plus x. The product of notation here is just, just denotes the quadratic product. So all the quadratic uh, yeah, products of x and h here, which is uh, here in n by n squared um, matrix tensor. So if you went through the same step, approximate the same step, approximate X in the sort dimensional basis B, substitute and close the doors of a commonality condition. This is the reduced order model you would get. A hat is just E transpose AB like before. B hat is E transpose B. H hat is nothing but the projection of that tensor H onto the low dimensional subspace. And hey, look, the reduced order model has got quadratic form. And you can probably imagine if you were to add qubit order and keep going, the same would be true. So projection preserves structure. And why is that so important? So important because structure is what reflects physical constraints. The fact that there's an A and an H here is not coincidence. It's here because the governing equation, the laws of nature, had terms in them that when we discretize them, or if we prefer to think in the PDU world, had terms that are linear in state or quadratic in state. Think about Navier Stokes equation. U to U to X is quadratic in U, right? So there's structure, the structure, and now it comes back to my concentric circles. The mathematical model, the structure rep represents the rules that we want to follow. The numerical model, the structure is manifesting in the form of the numerical model, and not just the fact that there's linear and quadratic, but also the properties of these sides. It's symmetric. What can we say about it? Eigenvalues. And projection is a really uh, special form of approximation that preserves here the, the form, the polynomial form, but also can be done in a way that it goes even further and preserves other properties in it. So um, I think many in the machine learning world have recognized that structure preservation is important. And we're starting to see, because that's how you get models to be predictive, we get to see a whole host of papers that are now tacking on things to their loss function where there's penalties to try to preserve structure. That's great. That's one line of research. But let's not forget that elegant uh, projection onto linear subspace gets you a lot of these things in it, and what I think is a much more interpretable and more Okay. So I don't think I've told you Anything you didn't already know, but hopefully I've made you think about a few things that you did know to make you realize that um old is sometimes uh, old is a bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay. All right. Now, so let me um now switch and, and start talking about operator inference work um that we've been doing. And let me also just make a comment that again, this is not new. Uh, projection review sort of modeling, projection based review sort of modeling, these notions have been around for many decades. In fact, that was the topic of my PhD back in the last century. While there are uh, many examples of successes of those methods in industry, uh, I think the adoption has been not nearly what it could have been. And the adoption is nowhere near what we see with machine learning. And so, one of the things over the last years that I have asked myself is why is it that there's these incredibly powerful methods that really haven't made their way out. And I think a big part of it is the barrier. The barrier to doing these things, I can write on a power, power quote chart, A transpose H is E plus B. What is this? Imagine you're going with a giant CSD code written in Fortran that you've been maintaining for decades. And now someone tells you, oh, you're going to need a, you need this program, you're going to need this H operator, you're going to need to go in there, and you're going to need to do these projections. 
space, just a non space. So the intrusive nature of uh, having to do these projections has been a huge barrier to getting them adopted, especially out in the industry where we're talking legacy and commercial code. So this is where this is where the machine learning people really have it right. Um, machine learning methods wrap around your code in a way that makes it very easy for you to adopt and use, right? You need to generate training data. And beyond that, you really don't even need to go into the insides of the code. So what we asked an operator in person, the first uh, work we did in operator in person was back when I was here at MIT in 2015, 2016, uh, is can we take this very rigorous, solid mathematical view of projection, but can we learn the projection-based reduced model in a way that goes machine learning style so we can get to the model without having to ever go in and do the projection? And the answer is yes, you can. And uh, as if with most things in life, it's just a linear algebra problem. It's very much we've been talking about data really and coming to get a linear algebra is finally required in the So again, uh, here's what we already saw. We saw that if we start with a linear problem, we get a reduced order model. If we start with a quadratic problem, we get a quadratic problem. So what does this tell us? This tells us the form of the reduced order model that we should look for if we want to use a projection projection based approach. So here's what we're going to do in operator inference. I'm not going to go into the details of the this couple of slides. We are going to um, infer the reduced model directly from data. You give me snapshot data, and I'm going to give you back a hat, b hat, and h hat. And the reason I'm giving you back a hat, b hat, and h hat is because I'm going to use knowledge of the governing equations that are in your hyperdollar simulator to find the form of the model. Now, a part of the talk that I'm not going to give because there just isn't time is you might be thinking, well, how many systems really take this form? Turns out there's a whole bunch of other tricks you can play with variable transformations and something called lifting to get many, many, many systems into the quadratic form. And if you're willing to admit differential algebraic equations, meaning you might have a singular E sitting out in front here, uh, pretty much many, many nonlinear PDEs, including reaction terms, uh, you know, all kinds of, of different PDEs you can get into this form. So again, that's the part I'm not going to tell you about today, but this is a very general form that we can work with for many classes of this problem. Okay, so we don't need a generic input output map. We know what the form of the reduced order model is that we're looking for. So we're going to look for this reduced model, which means I need to give you a hat, b hat, and h hat. How am I going to do that? I'm going to generate snapshot. I'm going to use the POD. So I'm going to do singular value decomposition on the snapshot. I'm going to define that low dimensional basis D. I'm going to compute the representation of the snapshot in the low dimensional basis D. That's just a B transpose X. So I'm not touching the insides of the rocket combustion code at this point, just operating on the data. Now, what I have is reduced order states in the, in the low dimensional, uh, these are the trajectories in the low dimensional subspace. I'm going to substitute those states and their derivatives into the form of the reduced model that I'm looking for. And I'm going to say, give me the A hat, the B hat, and the H hat that minimizes the residual that I do that. So if you like to call it such a thing, the loss function. So again, I'm learning, inferring, optimizing for A hat, B hat, and H hat. The things in blue are the data that I use, that I got from, from the training run. And the reason we're using a minimum residual is because when you do that, things in blue are data. Things in black are what we are looking for. This is nothing but a linear B squared problem. And by the way, we can have two base coordinates. The nonlinearities are in the data part. The coefficients of the reduced model we're looking for are um, are linear. So it's a linear problem, which means we can solve it at scale. Now, again, there's a lot of details um, that we've been working out over the last year. Turns out, yes, it's a linear least squared problem, but numerically can be very ill-conditioned. So regularization in some way to treat ill-conditioning is really important. And then Benjamin uh, Pierstopper has a really nice paper where he showed that if you uh, do a little bit of, of trickery with the data, with those X hats, then you can prove it. So I should say in the original operator inference paper, 2016, we showed an asymptotic product recovery of the intrusive reduced model, asymptotic mathematicians like this were not very practical, not very useful in 
reality. What Benjamin showed in 2020 is that if you do a little bit of uh, work on the data, you can provably recover for finite R, the intrusive reduced model. In other words, the one that you would have gotten if you've done the transcendental D is one of the intrusive. And why is that important? That is important because thanks to Professor Putterer and others, we have error estimated for large class of problems. So again, I'm not telling you a lot of the details, but this should get you thinking that it is actually possible to have a little bit of the best of both worlds, which is you can learn reduced models non-intrusively, but you don't have to give away on this notion of projection, which is what buys you the ability to preserve structure, enforce properties that may be important and sometimes get uh, error estimates. Okay, but again, it's all non intrusive. The only thing we need from the high fidelity simulation is the ability to generate snapshots. And it's not black box because we do need to know what model you sold it. So we're going to be a search for engine and kind of uh, So we use knowledge of the form of the physics and then, and then the data. And at the end of the day, everything's linear algebra, which means we can make uh, use of. Scalable and 3D, it's, it's really big scale, random, things like randomized SPD if we can't do them for SPD. Uh, of course, they don't know say the Texas the computers are much bigger than they are here at MIT. And so, if you look at some of the problems, you see we can actually do the SPD in one way, which is really really nice. But we can also reach for the next scale of uh, linear algebra and do it. Okay, so we'll move to get to both of So uh, just um, really quickly before I get to the really fun stuff, which is the quadratic manifold, uh, these are the, some of the kinds of things we've been able to do. I mentioned we've been doing a lot of work with the Air Force uh, over the past few years. So Elizabeth and her thesis did a 3D injection model that one uh, had almost 20 million degrees of freedom. GEMS is this uh, lovely kind of volume code that the Air Force uses for the combustion simulation. Um, Pressure turns out, to, and, and so what, what you're seeing here is a reduce of the model with 100 states compared to the CFD with almost 20 million. Pressure turns out to be something you can actually get relatively well. What you see here, this is where we have training data. So training and then out here we're predicting into the future. Pressure is relatively easy to get. That's because it's sort of global acoustically dominated physical phenomenon. Um, temperature is much harder. This is where the transport really comes to. to to make things difficult, um, and I'll talk more about that in a second. But what we're doing here, this is a 2D problem. Here's where we did a back-to-back -back between our operator inference and then an intrusive, as here, here design as an intrusive method. And you know what we take away here is okay, the the predictions, especially as you go further out in time, are not great. But uh, our reduce the models are as good as the state of the art and intrusive. So they give them a little better, but what's really key is I was so much easier and faster to solve, complete to implement, that it didn't take two years of working with the Air Force to put those projections into the Air Force code. Instead, we're just working with the, the snapshot data. Um, this non intrusive, non intrusive nature of our method has really made us work with uh, a lot of different people. So we're right now working with the Air Force on retaining detonation engines. And again, they're generating training data. They're sending us these giant sets of snapshots, and we're able to work with the reduced model. One of us been doing some work with Lockheed, where it's uh, Pun 3D and NASA CFD code and mass trends uh, for the, the structures. Did error elastic analysis and you know, their commercial code. No hope of going inside. Uh, additive manufacturing with Oak Ridge, and then the, the other combustion units. So. Again, and I, I, I may not have said this, if you can do intrusive reduce the model, you should. But if you can't, and many people can't realistically do that, I think there is uh, a pathway. There are other options before you reach for the All right. So this brings me to the last part. And like I said, if you don't like linear algebra, start checking your emails. Look your board, start checking your emails. Um, I'll go kind of quickly through this, and um, it's going to be just a little bit more detailed. But this is some of the more recent work we're doing, this is work uh, Rudy Thielen, who is one of my current postdocs at the Owen Institute. Um, and it's, well, anyway, we'll get started. It's, it's pretty exciting. So sometimes a linear basis is not enough. I talked about the beauty of projection onto a linear subspace because of the way it preserves and exposes the structure of the problem. Sometimes a linear basis is not enough. 
And uh, singular values, by the way, when you, if you're doing anything in your digital model, the first thing you should do is cut singular values. Once you get into blue, do not come into my office if you want to plot the singular values. Because the singular values tell you so much about what's going on in your problem. And when you see this, you're in trouble because the singular values are decaying so, slowly enough that if you truncate at any reasonable level, you have a whole lot of information that is not going to be embedded that on the basis. And by the way, every time you read a paper on reduced order modeling, you should uh, be putting your skeptic hat on and wondering how expensive is your reduced model to run? Because I could reduce a problem from 20 million down to 1,000, and that would look really impressive. But because these reduced models are dense, that 1,000 dimensional reduced order model is probably more expensive than the, the 20 million uh, degree of freedom problem I started with. So don't be, don't be fooled by looking at the bar. Anyway, singular values to pay. So this is a Khan Hilliard uh, phase field model, classic example of a problem that is not amenable to approximation in a low dimensional subspace. This is a slow singular value to pay. Even simpler example, the linear wave equation. Again, a classic example where the nature of the problem, the physics, the, the transport dominated physics, are uh, such that approximation here really is in trouble with singular value So uh, what can we do? There has been a whole sort of work over the last one to two decades in different methods, adaptive model reduction, and simulation methods, nonlinear manifolds, dictionaries, uh, various problem specific approaches to maybe composition lists. There's are many people working and a lot of advancements that have been shown to, to, to break some of this, this challenge. But again, these approaches are all intrusive, and what's more, they're even more complicated than just the basic stuff I talked about. And so, again, you can go to Boeing or the Air Force and see a whole lot of these methods actually, actually being used. So we ask the question, is there something we can do in the operator inference setting, where, again, we want to keep the notion of projection, the notion of structure of the problem, but also keep the non-intrusivity. So the rule of the game is, know what's being solved in the high fidelity system, but all you're allowed to ask for is data. All you're allowed to ask for is data. Is there something that we can do with a with a pragmatic method? Okay, so here's the slide I showed before, right? This is the basic model linear system projection onto linear subspace. And remember, we were approximating high dimensional state X in the low dimensional sub, uh, low dimensional subspace, the space expected to be, and X cat was that approximation. So what we're going to do now is say, well, what if we actually approximate X in a quadratic manifold? And what does that look like? X is approximated as V and X cat plus, now let's have another V bar. Let's call it a basis. I'll probably refer to it as a basis. You'll see in a second, it might not actually mathematically be a basis, but call it that. And then the quadratic term. And by the way, there's usually an X ref, even in plain old QB, people usually don't be very careful about it. But, uh, I put it here on the slide because it actually turns out to be very, very important to have the right kind of centering for the data. It seems to be more important than the quadratic manifold approximation. Okay, so X hat still the reduced state, um, B is still the linear basis, and uh, a new set of modes in E bar. And one other thing I'm going to say just to keep X, X position simple, I'm going to write this chronic product and I'm calling it dimension R squared. Of course, the quadratics, uh, there's redundancy, like x1, x2 is the same as x2, x1. So this isn't exactly r squared, it's actually r, r plus 1 over 2, but slides get, the message gets more complicated. So we do eliminate the redundant degrees of freedom, but I'll just refer to it as, as r squared. All right, so there are two questions now. First of all, if you want to do this, uh, what should be a d bar be? And then the second question is, if you do this, what form does the reduced order model take? Because remember what we're doing is the thought experiment of projection to identify the form of the reduced model so we know what to learn and operate the inference problem. So I'm gonna answer those two questions. The first one is uh, how to compute V, V bar and the mapping from X to X cat. So uh, again, given snapshots, here are the snapshots and the snapshot matrix X. We need to determine V, which is N by R, and V bar, which is N by R squared -ish. And this is going to be our approximation. So, in this paper, which appeared uh, last year, it's in a physics collaboration with Steve Wright, who spent some time with us in Austin, we break the task into two steps. 
you choose me to give the best money of it. You know what that is, right? It's sort of a value. You can't put the risk next to the director. And then choose V bar to minimize the remaining of it. And you'll see why we do that in a second. It is suboptimal, but it turns out to be computationally efficient. It's very, very saleable, and it fits really nicely with the linear dimensionality reduction. And it's also got a really nice interpretation of the closure problem. So let's see how this works out. Uh, v is, again, in the best linear fit, nothing but the SPD is a snapshot matrix. That's what we were doing before. Now, V bar to minimize the remaining misfit. So here are the snapshots, the XJs. Here's the approximation of the quadratic monopole, x ref plus v x hat plus v x hat squared. So taking that difference, minimizing the residual. And uh, because I made this choice up here, by the way, the x hat are uh, nothing but v transpose, v transpose there. Okay, so there's that, that misfit term again. I'm just gonna rewrite it. I'm just gonna Simplify the notation. So I'm going to introduce here W and epsilon. W are uh, these guys here. These are the quadratic products of the projected snapshot. And epsilon is uh, epsilon is this guy right here, and uh, this guy right here. And I, again, I'm just rewriting it to expose what really is going on here. It's I minus V transpose. Operating on the snapshots, and, and remember the x ref is just shifting the center in place. So, what's i minus v transpose? It's v per v per transpose. This is the part, this is the classical SPD error, right? It's the part of the snapshot set that is not represented in the linear subspace. So, when you write it this way, I mean, the first thing you see is, oh my goodness, it's another linear v squared problem, right? Okay? V bar, this v bar is what we're solving for here. This is nothing but a linear v squared problem. And what's more, when you write it this way and you see that this is epsilon, you can see that, uh, that, and I'm actually going to get it on the next slide. If you write out the normal equation, you're going to see that V bar is now lying in the space of, of V per. In other words, V bar is orthogonal to V by construction, which is the way we set this up. So again, there's a whole lot of linear algebra here. It's just, Plugging and chugging at this point, writing out the normal equation and getting to this explicit expression, solution of the linearly squared problem for that basis for those modes V bar and recognizing that we have by construction this condition. And so this is where now um, we get this interpretation of the quadratic term of disclosure. And I have a little, um, you know, here, I have a little example that might help to sort of put all the linear algebra together. So here's just a 3D uh, trajectory, cosine t, sine t, and cosine 2t two over 2. So in black here is the, that trajectory in the 2D space. And what would we do if we were doing a linear, a linear subspace? So we get two degrees of freedom for the linear subspace. Those are the first two left angular vectors. And that's the, the blue hash plane. And then what's the blue here? That's the projection. That's the optimal representation in the two dimension. So what are we doing with this extra quadratic term? We're saying we don't get any more degrees of freedom. So it has still got dimension two. But what you do get to do is you get to add on these extra terms, the V hat one, the V hat two, the V hat three, you get three extra directions. By the way, you don't need four, you only need one. Second, you get three extra directions, but you don't get to choose the coefficients in those directions. The coefficient multiplying these extra V1, V bar 1, V bar 2, V bar 3 are determined by the coefficients that came out of the Cindy value coefficient. Right? So it's constrained. And but uh but what you can you can do is you can do a much, much better job and the interpretation, there's a couple of ways you can interpret it. One is that this is a closure because you're introducing the effects of the neglected dimension. Uh, the things that were in V per. Another interpretation is that you're taking this linear subspace and you're essentially walking it into a quadratic matrix. Okay, so I jumped over this one, but this now summary of question one how do we uh, compute the V, the V bar, and uh, the mapping? So V is the, the first the singular vectors, V bar is the solution of the linear least squared problem and then x hat equals v transpose x plus four. So a couple notes. 
We are introducing these additional directions. We are not increasing the dimension of the state. So the reduced model model is still in that example of a two dimensional R equal to state. It turns out a better formulation is not to do what I just told you, but instead to take the next. So you took the first R singular vectors. A better formulation is to take the next few singular vectors and then optimize for the weights on those singular vectors. And the analysis looks fairly similar. You still get orthogonality. But it's actually a more compact uh, representation. And you can kind of see that in that example because I ended up with three C bars and I really only need this one. And so by formulating it this way, uh, it's, it just it gets a little bit more compact. An even better formulation actually is to do an iteration using a clustered formulation that lets you optimize V and V bar simultaneously. And we uh, actually just submitted a paper that you can see that will stick on archives uh, shortly. Where we do both of these two things. But again, not to, I don't want to overcomplicate the method in the, in the seminar. I want you to get the idea of what's going on here with the quadratic manifold that is a linear and quadratic term, but there's still only R degrees of freedom. And you can think about it like closure. But. Okay, but now we still need to answer the second question is like, okay, you can do all of this. What does it mean for the reduced model? And this is where I think it's really pretty cool, um, which is. Go back to the linear full order model. We start equal a plus b u. Substitute in now x is b a cap plus b cap squared. Go through the machinery of computing the residual, do the work and projection. The reduced order model of a quadratic manifold approximate using a quadratic manifold approximation of a linear system is a quadratic system. So the quadratic approximation here, what did it do? It introduced this quadratic term in the reduced order model that wasn't there in the full model. And this is another way that you can think of this as being like an closure. This is the kind of thing that pops up with even closure model. You get extra terms showing up in your governing equation. And of course, in this case here, yeah, you can look at all these um, definitions for a hat, h hat, c hat, b hat, and then b and b bars. But you can see where we're going with this. We don't want to do all of this. We're now just going to close to operator inference. I've got a linear system, learn me a quadratic model. And the quadratic model is incorporating the effect of this uh, quadratic population up here. If I started with a quadratic system, I would get a coordinate, reduce all the model down here, and then got to uh, deal with, with scalability a little bit, but uh, it's pretty good. Okay. So, um, and maybe I'll just, if I should end. Uh, and then a couple minutes, I'll just show you going back to that wave equation again. This is one where the singular value decay really, really uh, comes to hurt you. So, here's a measure of how much energy you retain in the snapshot, how much of that snapshot set can you represent in your low dimensional spaces or your manifold. Here's the linear, the linear manifold. Here's what the quadratic manifold buys you. Again, the reduced basis dimension is saying R. And the reason you're doing better is because you're introducing these additional directions in the sort of closure, closure form. So this makes a huge difference when it comes to coming up with a reduced order model for something like the wave equation. Because if you try to do approximation in a linear subspace, you end up with all kinds of Gibbs phenomena and all kinds of issues. And you can see here the, the quadratic manifold here with 21 degrees of freedom. She's pretty remarkable how it manages to capture what's going on here. So uh, we're pretty excited about this work and um, see now how far we can push it. If you think back to those combustion examples and how we weren't doing a great job on the temperature, I believe that this kind of quadratic manifold approach is uh, something that we really have. Okay, so in summary, what I've told you with operator inference is again the class of problems where we know what the physics are, we don't have to discover them. We have a high fidelity model. We cannot get inside that high fidelity model to do fancy stuff, but we are not willing to give up on the theory. And so we're really trying to hit that middle ground. But at the end of the day, everything is singular value decomposition, so there are a problems. Um, there are a lot of elements that go in there. I haven't talked much about the inverse theory that actually helps you understand what goes on here with this inverse problem and we uh, deal with things like uh, linear linearization. Um, I said probably some negative things about machine learning. I don't mean to discount the importance of machine learning. 
I think it's really important to keep in mind that we have a range of tools for a range of use cases. And one of the things to the young people here that you really have to get good at is not reaching for a tool because it's popular, but reaching for a tool because it's the right one for the, the job that you're doing. And, uh, um, you know, I think thinking about that, really appreciating that with machine learning and training dump data that come in the search space um, is, is essential. And if we're talking about three months to simulation for those lucky engines, you can imagine just how hard it is to get a you know, training data that, that you need to do. Okay, there are a whole bunch of uh, challenges and open questions, but I think I'm going to go over those and end there and take some questions. So, thank you. Um, so, let's we'll take some questions in the room and I'll see you next. Um, yeah. The talk is really exciting and interesting. It's a really great talk. And, um, I think the map that you developed for uh, yes, your first developed for the graphic system, uh, operator system. I think I'm very interested the, uh, that you extend the theory of those to include the graphic basis inside of. Um, I, I think it's very interesting that those are the the um, I really need to know. So, um, uh, and I, 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 I it's uh, very interesting that you already said, mentioned that you can optimize both a uh, billion and V-bar at the same time. I think that's a very exciting to do. Uh, see now, it's not. Yeah. Um, I, I think, of course, you can extend it beyond for other people and go to three rooms, because I saw on that there's a question. I think for other people, uh, more than enough for a lot of problems. Yeah. So, so what, what do you think about that? Yeah, so, um, I mean, quadratic is really smart because you're going from the mean to quadratic. But uh, actually, that would even have to be called a number. So you can think about what V bar kind of final. Chose to because remember, whatever is multiplying the columns of V bar ends up in the operator inference problem. In the data. So, all those nonlinearities go into the data. So all you need to be able to do is do those manipulations on the snapshot here. And one of the things I've often thought about, actually, I had flashbacks back to my general exam, which don't even exist anymore in Perl Astro, but you just have to take the general exam, you can see the piece of code over there, calculate the difference, and that's random and that's functions. I got asked to do something that involves vessel functions to try to get an element solution. But it made me think that often in physical problems, um, the data is on the physical problems that we were in the But often for problems, there are particular, like there, there are simple, not simple, but there are canonical problems where you can actually do analytic solutions. And there are particular functional forms that show up, right? I mean, if you have a of a periodic solution, you think you find the cosine showing up in a right solution. So bringing even more knowledge of the structure of physics and using them to think about what is the right kind of representation um, with a term like like V bar. But because of the way we do it, and because of the minimum residual formulation, whatever nonlinearity you put in there and move to the data, and ultimately you sort of will need to So we're just been thinking about a few of those things, but I do think it's um I think it's more Maybe a fruitful area of work for the problems where approximation and linear structures don't work well, and those are things like the equation, um, here we are, the case of models. Um,
Well, so, so there are two parts to this. There's the, there's the, the dynamics that live in the cross space. That's part of the structure, but then, you know, part of the structure is, for example, symmetry of like properties of A, like with that represent symmetry of invariances and things that are in the physics. And we already asked you about the first part of it, which is can we generate enough snapshot to really sample all the behavior that we expect to see um, so that the low dimensional subspace or the manifold or whatever it is that we're learning is rich enough. And you know, the first, so, so for high, for truly high dimensional sample spaces, that remains on the side. So there's been a lot of work in adaptive sampling methods and this sort of thing. It's a new approach where you combine that and maybe combine with error estimates. But even so, you know, 10, 100 experiments is a real challenge going to thousands of millions. So I would say that that, that remains a, a huge challenge. But by the way, machine learning doesn't get around this. But, um, because you still have to sample a vast dimension of the of space. And as we start to talk about things like the real twin, for any kind of surrogate to be useful for the real twin, you're going to have to deal with that dimensionality of the parameter space. So that's where things like the um, decomposition, so things like static limitation, where these basic elements are going to be coming through, that break the problem up into pieces so that you never see the full dimension, but you can sample these sort of chunks of the parameter. I think those are going to be really important. I guess you're right. There's, there's no magic, right? There's, there is no magic in using these sort of models, and you can only represent what you can see, and you only see what you can afford to sample and change. So with, all, yeah. so, with, so with all these problems, you have to ask the question, what is it you're trying to do? Like, what are the quantities of interest that you want to be able to predict? And is a wrong the right tool? And it goes back to my slide about a range of tools. Is a wrong the right tool for it? And if you're thinking about a chaotic system where there's incredible sensitivity to initial conditions, and it's very, very important that we can resolve that, then a wrong one might be the right tool for it. And, and so again, I think the field is just at the beginning, but there's some sort of approaches that will, for example, Hamiltonian approaches. How do you present Hamiltonian structural or non structural or these sort of models? So again, if you want particular problem conservation is something that's really important. With these prediction approaches, you can build that into the reduced model in a way that you can guarantee, as opposed to just stuffing it as a penalty to a loss function where it's loosely enforced. Um, but how how to do but again, this time you don't ever get to go from 200 million degrees of freedom to 20 and get to keep it all. Like, well, in fact, we even know you don't get to go from infinite dimensional to million dimensional and keep it all. So being very intentional about what matters to your problem and then taking the method from there, I think is really important. And I actually feel like that's something that we need to get lost in the day. Thank you. One more question, and then we'll take it up offline. Thank you for your time. I was a very intrigued by this idea of structural conservation in the digital and I was referring to the machine in which sometimes the person is going to function in the center of the machine. I don't know if it's going to be a stretch to my own opinion in the audience in terms of the reduction. So it wasn't really connections there, but I don't know if it's going to be a stretch to my own opinion. So the answer, I'm sure, is yes. And in fact, Omar and I are going to go around and talk about this. He said the same thing that. When you do some of these upscaling approaches, what you see is just extra purity and appear on the stage at the end. Um, and I mean, I think it's I think I think it's fascinating. That's why I wanted to gather a couple of years. I think it's fascinating to say, okay, linear equation, approximation of linear subspace, linear equation, linear equation, approximation of the quadratic subspace, quadratic equation, extra term pops up, has this meaning. And Omar pointed out that exactly the same thing has happened to these physics based approaches. Where you do, where you're approximating or, or upscaling or moving between scales, and what you end up with is another physical equation that has extra terms. And those extra terms are in a way non physical, but they have physical meaning because they're capturing the effects of things 
of other things. And I would I like, so the answer is yes, this is what should have we haven't made any real change, but um and, and I feel like I think like this is sort of a powerful thing that people in specific fields know, and it's really around modeling. Get back to the core of the circle, right? Which is mathematical modeling. And but can we make more general purpose tools that are doing those kinds of things in this in this place? So I'd love to come back and I think that this is more about that. If you have if you have not made any way to differentiate anything. So there's many more questions, but uh, let's take care of the answer which is fine.